Welcome to our digital family and our Siena, Cyprus, and downtown campus, as well as The Loop. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 5. If you got your Bible, I want you to turn there. But while you're turning there, I want to tell you about something special that we've been doing. We love kids around here, high school kids, all the way down to preschool kids and little babies. And we love special needs adults as well. And we have been putting together something that we're really excited about because it's just showing that we want to be a culture that cares. We've had protection policies in place for those groups of people for years and years and years, and they've been awesome. But we've decided to strengthen those policies to make them even stronger, even more robust. And what we're calling it is a CISNA protection policy. And it's important for you to hear this. We want you to hear this as moms and dads, as church members of the things we're doing to protect our children, our youth, and our special needs adults. That's what CISNA means, is we want to protect our children, our youth, our special needs adults. And you can text CISNA to 81411 and we'll send you to our webpage. We got a lot of information or the QR code uh, that is there. So what this is, is we now have a 10-step screening process that we're asking every volunteer to go through to make sure that everything is on the up and up and to make sure we can really take care of these kids and these special needs adults. Now, here's what I want you to know. I've gone through the process Our executive pastor has gone through the process. All of our campus pastors have gone through the process. Staff has gone through the process. This is very important to us. And so I wanted to lead by example, even though I don't directly work with our kids and special needs adults, but to be able to lead by examples to go through this entire 10-step process. And we just want you to know that so that you can know what's going on in the church and some of the things that we're doing and the importance of it. And so if you're a volunteer in our ministries in those areas, when, when you're asked to do that as well, you'll know that I've been through it just as much as we're asking you to go through it and that God can really uh, use that to protect our kids. Let's pray together and then we're going to jump into God's word. Lord, thank you so much, Father, for who you are and what you do. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us a wonderful opportunity to minister to so many kids, so many youth, so many children as well, students, special needs adults, all of our campuses, Father. And so we thank you, Lord. We want to have the most robust protection policy that you can possibly have. And so we just lift that up to you, Lord. And we thank you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs chapter five, we've been going through Proverbs, just not the whole thing, but we've been reading the whole thing. I hope you've been doing that. But going through Proverbs and just some little spots along the way. And when you get to Proverbs chapter five, it's gonna give us a warning of some Solomon's warnings. He's gonna say, I want you to be warned about this. So I started thinking about, there's warnings on everything that we have in these days, isn't there? All these lawsuits have created all these warnings. So here's a couple kind of comical warnings that we got for you. The wheelbarrow, one of the wheelbarrows says not intended for highway use. I mean, would you really do that? No, you wouldn't do that. Another one that we got for you here. I like this one. This is my favorite one. Chipotle's trucks have drivers do not carry burritos is what they've got, which is awesome as well. The third one out of four we've got here is this product not intended to use as a dental drill. So if you're a dentist and your drill looks like this, We ain't coming to you, brother. It ain't going to happen. That's not going to happen. Then the last one, if you didn't know, now you know, don't, do not iron while wearing shirts. So some warnings that are obvious to us, some warnings that are kind of basic to us. But to be able to see in Proverbs chapter five, Solomon's going to give us some warnings about how to protect our marriage and how to protect our sexual purity to protect our marriage and protect our sexual purity. Now, what's interesting when we jump into the passage of scripture, he speaks to his son that most commentators believe was single. So single adults and students, I don't want you to tune this out of like, oh, this is a marriage message. Yes, it's got a marriage connotation and there'll be a lot about that, but it's also a single message. So whether you're dealing with the temptation of pornography dealing with the temptation of same-sex attraction, dealing with the temptation of premarital sex, if it's just lustful thoughts, or if it's a temptation of adultery. All of these things that we're gonna talk about will give us some helps of how we can honor God in the things that we're doing. Now, he's gonna begin in just a moment, you'll see, and he's gonna say, son. It's gonna be a father sharing with his son. Now, I want to stop right there before we even get to the scriptures and say this. When we get to it, parents, I want you to know the primary responsibility on teaching about sex is the parent's responsibility. 
And that's why we're kind of in a world of hurt in a lot of ways, because maybe we didn't hear it from our folks like we needed to hear it. And then also the church wasn't speaking about it. But you can't be silent about it as the church. Proverbs 5, Proverbs 6, and Proverbs 7 are all about this issue. We're going to jump into Song of Solomon in a couple of weeks and talk about intimacy within marriage. The Bible is very vocal about sex. God created it. God has a plan for it. So the church can't be silent and the parents can't be silent. He says, son, I want you to know this. Now, parents, let me give you just a little tip. They will figure out the biology, I promise you. They'll figure that out. What they need your help on is the theology of sex, the true intimacy of sex, the spirituality of sex, of what God has planned for sex. That's what they need. So how do you do that? You have it by having the conversations early and often. That's how you have it early and often. You don't just say, okay, time for the talk. Everybody come in the family. Dad's got something to say. That will freak everybody out, okay, is what they'll do. And they'll look for their information somewhere else. So Solomon comes and he says, son, I want you to hear this and I want you to hear it from me. So speaking about it early and often, is it easy? No. Is it comfortable? No. Is it important? Yes. It's vastly important. So more than just teaching them how to ride a bike, more than teaching them how to throw a ball, better than teaching them manners at the table, we've got to teach them how to handle their soul in the midst of what's happening in our world in a sex-crazed culture. So let's look into Proverbs chapter 5 as singles, as married, as students, as people that all of us struggle. It's a powerful, powerful thing of sex. And let's look at the ABCs, if I can give them to you like that. The ABCs of walking in sexual purity. Here we go. Verse 1, chapter 5. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen closely to my understanding so that, always circle so that in your Bible, what's going to come after so that, so that you may maintain discretion and your lips safeguard knowledge. Though the lips of the forbidden woman drip honey and her words are smoother than oil, she in the end is as bitter as wormwood. That was a plant. It was a bitter plant and as sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death and her Steps go straight, head straight for Sheol. That's the Hebrew word for place of the dead. She does not consider the path of life. She does not know that her ways are unstable. Here's the first letter I want to give you of ABC. Here it is. A is avoid the lure of temptation. Avoid the lure of temptation. I want everybody, all campuses, digital family, loop, everybody, I want you to say on the count of three the word avoid. One, two, three, avoid. One, two, three, avoid. The A of the ABCs of protecting your marriage and your sexual purity is avoid. Avoid the lure of temptation. Now, Proverbs uses an allegory of a woman all throughout Proverbs. Chapter one, chapter eight, it's the woman of wisdom. Chapter five, chapter six, chapter seven, it's the woman of adultery. Chapter 31, it's the ideal woman is what it is. So he's going to show here the woman of adultery and how he's going to explain her is this. Now, does this mean women are bad? No, it could just as easy be a man in this thing, but he uses the allegory of a woman. Now, here's what he does. He says she is, her words are sweet like honey, but then it turns bitter like wormwood. She is smooth as oil. And then it turns to a double-edged sword. There was nothing sweeter in Israel than honey and nothing more bitter in Israel than wormwood. There was nothing smoother than olive oil and nothing sharper than a double-edged sword. And so here's what he's saying. The sweetness will turn to bitterness and the smoothness will turn to sharpness. You will pay a price. There will be a downfall. The description of the seductive woman is how Satan is trying to make sin appear, to make sin appear attractive. He's trying to lure us in. He's trying to pull us forward. He's trying to say, look how attractive, look how sweet this is. Look how smooth this is. Look how awesome this is. This is gonna be great. She's prettier than your wife. He's more kind than your husband. He really understands you. She really wants you. This is gonna be awesome. And what is sweet to the taste will turn to gravel in your mouth. When you think about this, you can think about a fishing lure. So you've got different kinds of lures that you can have in fishing. 
So you got this here, you got a spoon here that's gonna shine and shimmer and that fish is gonna look at it and go, oh man, look how pretty that is. That's just solid gold, ready to go right there. Then you've got here, you've got a plastics that here are plastic ones that one's like a shrimp and one's like a worm and it looks just almost like the real thing. Then you've got as well, you've got this, it's a spinner and this little gold thing is spinning while this little worm is wiggling. And what is it doing? It's all these things to draw the attention to the fish and the fish doesn't know that there's a hook in the bait. It looks almost real, pop, and it sets the hook in the mouth. Oh, she looks so good. He sounds so nice and pop, the hook is in the mouth before you know it. Avoid the lure of temptation. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 says, for no temptation has overtaken you except which is common to man. And with every temptation, God is faithful and provides a way of escape so that you may bear up under it. Do you notice that I have it memorized? To be able to understand that there's temptation coming for all of us and that God wants to show us, I have a doorway, I have an out, I have an exit, I want you to go. The temptation's gonna come in many ways, but in two ways in particular. One, it's gonna come in words. It says that our words are like honey that it's sweet like honey, that they drip as her words are smoother than oil. Proverbs chapter six, verse 23 and 24 says this, for the commandment is a lamp, this is the Bible, and teaching is light and corrective discipline is the way of life. What he's saying is this, it's really hard to have a quiet time in the morning and an affair in the evening. Stay in the word of God, for they will protect you from the evil woman. Again, could be man from the flattering tongue of the wayward woman. Communication may seem innocent at first, but it can hook you quick. Hey man, it's, it's just a coworker at the office and she just laughs at all your jokes. What's the big deal? Just an old flame on Facebook that's just chatting back and forth with you. A few text messages don't really mean anything. That friend that seems to understand you better than your spouse, in that moment, you need to hear something in your head. Here's what you need to hear. You need to hear the theme song to Jaws is what you need to hear in that moment. <laughs> Whenever you begin to like that communication a little bit too much, da-dun, 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 dun 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 I know students, that's a real old movie for you, but you know whatever your movie is, you can tell that moment when you're like, don't go into that room, don't walk into that room. The music will tell you what's about to happen. And though it looks like a great little lure and it's flashing gold, there's a hook. And so he's saying, I want you to be careful about the words. Young, a young man in Proverbs 7 is being seduced in verse 21 by the words of this lady. He's getting too close to the line. See, the question students and adults as well is not how far is too far. The question is what direction do I need to run? Where do I need to flee temptation? You stand on the edge of the cliff, all you need is a strong wind and you're off it. You stand on the edge of the pool, it's just another step before you fall in. See, in Proverbs 7, where it talks further about this, the young man is in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong person seeking the wrong activity and the wrong thing happens. You don't end up on accident with no clothes on. There's a process that happens and that you have the wrong place, the wrong time, the wrong person seeking the wrong t attention and the wrong activity, and so the wrong thing happens. Secondly, there's looks. Those looks, we've all had a first glance, and then it's led to a second glance that we shouldn't have had. Maybe it's pornography, and the clicks have led to looks that now are seared in your mind and in your brain, and it's got a hold around your neck now. And it says in Proverbs, in Job chapter 31, verse one, says this, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully upon a woman. I made a deal with God to not look lustfully upon a woman. You can't stop a bird from fly, flying in front of your face, but you can stop it from making a nest on your head. You can't stop who walks in front of you, but you can stop if you keep following the walking. You can't change every billboard, but once you identify what that billboard's about, you can say, I'm gonna keep focused on the road. The look can end up bringing a gaze and the gaze can turn to a craving and the craving can turn into an unction and the desire and unction can turn into sin and sin can turn into death. James chapter one, verse 14, but every person is tempted when he was drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. 
Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. The look. Why do you think in Matthew chapter five, Jesus said, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Is that because he likes blindness over sight? No, because he's serious about sin. And so I want you to be careful what you look at. And I want you to be careful what you're putting in your eyes because your eyes are the gateway to your heart and your lust in your eyes can turn into your lust of your heart. And the lust of your heart can turn into fantasies and desires. And next thing you know, you're in a place you don't want to be and God doesn't want you to be. And so we've got to be careful about these things with the words, with the looks. Now, when you're listening, God, I want to point you to something here. And even our digital family, your host, will give you the link to this. This is a list. I've used this before, but it's worth saying again. Again, I say, often Paul would say, again, I say rejoice. So again, I'm going to tell you here. It's 12 steps to an affair. Now, I want you to know, this is not a how-to list, okay? I'm not trying to tell you how to do this. You're like, well, I've always kind of thought that was exciting. Now I know. I learned at church how to have an affair. This is great. This is an identification of you're going off the road, okay? This is what this is, okay? Because a lot of times we get to, you'll see step nine or 10, and we think, oh, that's the affair part. Well, you don't end up naked accidentally. And so number one is there's a readiness emotionally. There's a readiness emotionally. Now, we've all got a readiness because we're creatures of sin, right? But we don't want to leave emotionally leaving the house ready for something. You want your husband to leave filled wives. You want your wife to leave filled husbands. You don't want her looking for praise from somebody else. You don't want him looking for attention from somebody else. Single adults, you have to look to Jesus and allow Jesus Christ to fill up your untimely desires before marriage and to let God fill you in those ways and to give you self-control as a fruit of the Spirit. So readiness is number one. Alertness is number two. All of a sudden, you become aware of that other person. Boy, she's cute. Man, he's handsome. An innocent meeting. You just bumped into each other at the elevator at the office. Just ended up at the same place. Kids just happen to be on the same sport team. Innocent meeting. Then there's an intentional meeting. I'll go by her desk. I'll just walk by that office. I'll see if he's in. I noticed his car in the parking lot. Wonder if he's at the break room. Now it becomes an intentional, but nobody can call you on it yet. Intentional meeting. Then there's public lingering. Time spent together in group settings. You start looking forward to that business meeting where he's there or she's there. And it's just a public thing. But then when the meeting breaks, it turns to number six. Time spent alone lingering after events and meetings. Now everybody's dismissed, but you two are just talking a little bit more and just having a little bit more of a conversation. That turns into number seven, purposeful isolation. Why don't we get together and talk about this project a little bit more? Pleasurable isolation Would you like to go to dinner now that we've been at the office working? Why don't we grab lunch together and see if we can just have a pleasurable isolation? Number nine, affectionate embracing. This is the part we go, oh, whoa, 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 you've crossed the line. Well, hey, you get to number nine because you're going through one through eight. And so number nine, you get to number nine and now there's affectionate, affectionate embracing. It's just a touch. It's just a hug. It's just some affection being shown. Then passionate embracing. Then sexual embracing. The capitulation of the, of the relationships commences. And then in 12, there's a justification of the relationship. I love her. He loves me. We're leaving our spouses and now we have mutual consent and there's an acceptance of the affair that now begins to be accepted of what is happening. Avoid temptation. Don't get to number nine before you try to put on the brakes. Realize what's happening in one through eight. And here's the deal. You'd be better thought as rude than interested. Better to be thought rude than interested. And if there's something you need to talk to your boss about, saying, hey, I just can't travel like this anymore. I can't do this quite like this before. We need to put somebody else on this text string. We need to make sure I can copy somebody. And you don't have to, you know, say the whole deal, but to be able to have protective things that are going on in your life so you don't just fall through this whole thing. It's a dangerous place and stronger people than you or me have fallen. And let's be wise about that. Now it's gonna give us our B and our B is beware of sin's outcome. Beware of sin's outcome. I want you to say with me on the count of three, the word beware. One, two, three, beware. Second word, avoid, beware. Here we go. We're gonna say beware again. One, two, three, beware. 
We want to beware of sin's outcome. Let's watch how fun this is in verse 7. You ready? See how fun this is. And I'm saying that very sarcastically. So now sons, he's expanding the audience to everyone. Listen to me and don't turn away from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Don't go near the door of her house. Don't click on that site. Don't go talk to her. Don't talk to him in that way. Verse nine, otherwise you will give up your vitality to others and your years to someone cruel. Strangers will drain your resources and your hard earned pay will end up in a foreigner's house. At the end of your life, you will lament when your physical body has been consumed. Verse 12, here's the, I wish I would have listened to Pastor Greg section. And you will say how I hated discipline, how my heart despised correction. I did not obey my teachers or listen closely to my instructors. I am on the verge of complete ruin before the entire community. Danny Aiken puts it like this, sexual sin is appealing. It promises pleasure and happiness and it can deliver it for a short time, but then it kills you. Sexual sin may cause you to walk away from God or to at least redefine God as someone who is okay with your sin. Now, who's writing this? Solomon. Solomon's dad's David. Solomon's mom's Bathsheba. I mean, he knows the troubles that this causes. And Solomon is a big time, has had a big time problem with ladies. He has got 700 wives and 300 concubines. And he is saying, time out, son, don't do what I've done. And parents, you and I both know this, we want better for our kids than we experienced. We don't want them to do the same things we did. And so Solomon steps forward with 700 wives, 300 concubines and says, this is not working. This is not the way it should be. Now, just comically, if, if Solomon, if you're his wedding planner, you've got great job security, right? I mean, this is going to work out well for you. If you do your DNA.com, whatever, uh, ancestry test, and you find out you're related to Solomon, well, that's pretty cool, but you ain't ever going to find out who your mama was. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> Not going to happen. So he says, I want y'all to listen and beware what you think is fun is not fun. It will get you. There is a hook in the lure and it will be in your mouth. Now, some would say, well, well, who's God to tell me about sex? God created it. He's got a plan for it. And within that plan is the way that it's to work. And that's where the blessing of true intimacy comes. Instead of outside of God's plan, trying to make our way, Sexual sin leads to three things and they're all found in the scripture. Number one, destroying your reputation. Did you see it in verse nine and in verse 14? It says, otherwise you will give your vitality to others and your years to someone who is cruel. Verse 14, I'm on the verge of complete ruin before the entire community. We've seen celebrities, we've seen athletes, we've seen pastors, we've seen friends, we've seen family blow up their lives with sexual sin. And it destroys the reputation. Now, let me quickly say this, right on the heels of what I just said. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to put a scarlet letter on you to wear the rest of your life. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ and it's instantaneous, it's real, it's graceful, it's true. And he stands waiting to forgive you in true repentance for all of your sins. Now, the forgiveness of your spouse, the forgiveness of your family, the forgiveness of other folks that have been affected, that's going to take a little bit more time. Take some counseling. It's going to take a lot of stuff. But to know that the forgiveness of Jesus Christ is right there. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to learn every time you see someone stand up behind a microphone and admit that they've had an adulterous relationship or some kind of sexual uh, escapade type of thing, I want you to watch men the hollowness in their wives' eyes is they can't even look up. And I want you to watch women, the destruction of the family and learn from other people's mistakes. Grace upon them, yes, they can receive the grace of Jesus, but receive it deeply as if it was you having to make the same confession destroying your reputation. 
Number two, draining your resources and possessions. Verse 10, this is expensive. Strangers will drain your resources. Your hard-earned pay will end up in a foreigner's house. You think one house is expensive, start trying to pay for two houses. You think marriage is expensive, start paying some lawyers. Think kids are expensive, start paying child support as well. And you watch what happens when it starts to do this and you've got double of everything that you had. It'll drain your resources, drain your possessions, drain your emotional stamina. It will drain everything that you've got and it will not be worth it. I remember a, a person that, that I know and know and knew and unfortunately they were not faithful in their marriage. And I said, tell me, tell me about it. And they said, it's exhausting. Didn't say it's awesome. Didn't say it's pleasurable. Didn't say it's exciting. Said it was exhausting. To keep the lie going is exhausting. And it drains your spirit and it drains your heart. Number three, in verse 11, deteriorating health deteriorating health. At the end of your life, you will lament when your physical body has been consumed. Sin makes you sick. Pornography makes you sick. Adultery makes you sick. Premarital uh, sex makes you sick. Things outside of God's realm make you sick. It's not the right way. This isn't how your body was supposed to function. It affects you emotionally. It affects you physically. It affects you spiritually. And all of this leads to the regret of not heeding wisdom. Sin hurts. Can I give you an illustration? Do you know how hard or how much sin hurts? Let me tell you how much sin hurts. Sin hurts so much, it was nails through the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. That's how painful sin was because he was the forgiveness of our sin nailed to the cross. And that nailing shows us the pain of sin, not just in our lives, but in other people's lives as well. But Psalm 103 talks about that he, he and his faithfulness and his forgiveness, God can throw your sins as far as the east is from the west. It's, his love is as high as the heavens above the earth. He loves you like a father. So again, I just jump in very quickly to say the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and the love of Christ, that Jesus loves you enough that he can break the pornography addiction in you. He loves you enough that he can break that lustfulness in your heart. Doesn't mean that you'll be perfect in every thought. The bird's gonna fly in front of your face, but it means that you can love Jesus more than you love your lust. And to allow God to protect your marriage and to protect your purity, single adults and students, until you do find that Mr. Right and that Miss, Miss Right and that God, one that God's got for you. Hang on to that purity, hang on to that purity. So we've seen to avoid, we've seen to be a, beware. And then now the third, the C, to chase after intimacy with your spouse. We've kind of been on the defensive, now we're gonna go on the offensive. Chase after intimacy with your spouse. A, avoid, B, beware, C, chase, A, B, Cs. I want you to see on the count of three the word chase. One, two, three, chase. One more time, one, two, three, chase. Chase after intimacy with your spouse. Here we go, verse 15, check it out. Drink water from your own cistern, water flowing from your own well. Should your springs flow in the streets, streams in the public squares, they should be for you alone, not for you to share with strangers. Don't let what's supposed to be private become public. Anything you've seen in a TV or movie has been done wrong. Because if it would have been done right, they wouldn't have done it on a TV or a movie. It's private. Verse 17, they should be for you alone and not for you to share with strangers. Let your fountain be blessed. Take pleasure in the wife of your youth. They could say husband as well. A loving deer, a graceful doe, or a studly buck, you know, okay? Let her breast always satisfy you. Be lost in her love forever. Why, my son, would you lose yourself with a forbidden woman or embrace a wayward woman? Think of the pain of Solomon saying that. For, the, for a man's ways are before the Lord's eyes. God sees and he considers all his paths. Remember that word paths in a minute. A wicked man's iniquities will trap him. He will become tangled in the ropes of his own sin. He will die because there is no discipline and will be lost because of his great stupidity. Anybody need to know the Hebrew word for stupidity or do you think we got it? 
Very clear here. Now he's saying here, I want you to chase after your spouse. And the first thing I want you to understand, what's private is private. What is public should not be the private things that are happening. He says, don't let your streams flow out into the public square. Don't let your streams go to the neighbor's house. Now, what's he saying? He's saying a couple things. I don't want your physical desires to leave your home. Don't go looking for any other place besides in your own home. I don't want you, another way to think of it, is fathering children, Solomon would be thinking, with someone else besides your wife, having children with somebody else besides your husband. So I want you to keep this in the home private. Now he's gonna give us five words. Did you see them? Here's the five words. Cistern, well, spring, streams, and fountain. Cistern, well, streams, fountain, uh, and springs. Those are the five words he's gonna give us. Now, what do those words mean? They are, all those things are symbolic of a controlled or life-giving water source. Cistern, controlled. Well, controlled. Springs, life-giving. Fountains, life-giving, right? Streams even, life-giving, that you've got a boundary. So he's saying, I want your sexual desires to be in a life-giving controlled place, not in a life-sucking, life-ending. Did you see the things we read before? And beware of life, of all the things against sin. I want them to be in a life-giving place, a controlled place. So within marriage, with the person that you are most intimate with verbally, most intimate with mentally, most intimate with in your lifestyle, then that gives birth to the physical intimacy. So don't take your streams to the street. That's for your house, that's for your husband, that's for your wife. It's not for your computer screen. It's not for a date as a single adult. It's not for a lustful thought as a student. It is for the confines of marriage. Our sexual desires are to be controlled and channeled into our marriages. Just like we wouldn't wanna drink from our neighbor's well, we wanna drink from our own well and have our physical needs met by our spouse. Now listen to this quote, it's very, very interesting and wise. Josh Squires says, when men feel disconnected, they often try to get physical intimacy via the root of recreational intimacy. Let's do something fun together and maybe we will end up being physically intimate. Whereas women, men and women think differently, when they feel disconnected, often they try to get emotional intimacy via the route of intellectual intimacy. Watch, here's how it plays out. Let's talk about something and maybe we will end up sharing our feelings. Both spouses feel the disconnection, but are trying to solve the problem in opposite ways. So men are trying to solve it in one way, ladies are trying to solve it in another way, and we end up going in different directions. Five different types of intimacy, okay? Write these down if you're taking notes. Spiritual, recreational, intellectual, physical, we've been talking a lot about that, and emotional intimacy, okay? Spiritual, recreational, intellectual, physical, and emotional intimacy. Let's take them one by one very quickly. Number one, spiritual intimacy. Well, what's spiritual intimacy? You're doing it right now. Sitting at church with your husband or your wife right now. That's great. Holding her hand during the prayer time, praying together, reading the Bible together, talking about the message, worship songs together. That's spiritual intimacy. It's so good. So good. Number two, recreational intimacy, doing something fun together. See, it's important that your happiest and most stress-free times are with your spouse. If girls' night or guys' night is more fun than date night, you better reassess. If girls' night and guys' night is more fun than date night, you need to reassess. Because here's what happens. When you begin to have recreation together and you have fun together, your body is releasing endorphins. You get the runner's high, so to speak, with it. And when that's happening together, you want your least stressful times, your most happy times to be when she's right here. Not you put in your mind, I'm the happiest when she's not here. I'm the happiest golfing with the buddies. I'm the happiest shopping with the ladies. I'm the happiest when she's right here. Parents, just a little thing. Have fun with your families. If your kids don't have fun with you, they're gonna find somebody to have fun with. And I promise you, your fun's gonna be more healthy than what's being offered as they just go along in life. So recreational intimacy, ladies, that might mean just stereotypically, you're gonna have to watch some basketball these next few days that you don't wanna watch. 
You're gonna have to do some shoulder to shoulder. Guys like it shoulder to shoulder, ladies like it knee to knee, okay? And if you're gonna be able to, to have him look you in the eyes, you're gonna have to watch something together like this as well and vice versa. Recreational intimacy, have fun together. Number three, intellectual intimacy, talking about things, reading books together or telling about the books you're reading, listening to the same podcast, talking about the things you're learning. I just listened to an audio book. I love audio books. Just finished one yesterday um, and, or two days ago actually. And yesterday, Kelly and I went on a walk. We love to walk. That's a recreational intimacy for us. So we walk all the time. And I said, hey, can I tell you about the book I just listened to? Let me tell you what, she has no care of the subject matter I just listened to. But she said, sure. And I said, do you know what? And I told her about the book I was listening to. Just, we talked about it. It was great. She didn't care about that book. I cared about the book. She cares about me, right? That's how it works. So I got to listen to other things as well to be able to have that intellectual intimacy, physical intimacy. We've been talking about that. And then emotional intimacy, sharing your emotions and feelings with your spouse. Which one of those do you need to step up your game on in your marriage personally? Which one does your marriage need to step up its game on in your marriage? Just stereotypically, ladies, you may just need to step up the recreational intimacy and men, you may need to step up the emotional intimacy. Just big broad brushstrokes, not the same for every person, just taking a stab at it. But purity is what God wants. So make it a habit. Put these things into your life habitually. This isn't just you did it like this because you heard a sermon on it. This becomes who you are. When you get oh, these five pistons popping in your marriage, these are strong in your life in protection of your marriage. And single adults as well. Let me wrap this thing up by saying this. In verse 21, he says something very interesting. It says, for a man's ways are before the Lord's eyes. God sees every click. God sees every action. He sees our heart and he sees it because he loves us and wants to rescue us from demise. And he considers all his paths. That word paths in Hebrew is the Hebrew word for wagon trails. How do you make a wagon trail? A wagon trail is made by habits of going the same direction over and over. That's how trails are made. Somebody just walks the trail over and over and over and it becomes a worn path. The wagons go, wagons, it was probably, I-10 was probably a wagon trail at one time or some roads were a wagon trail. Went, That's where the people are. Let's make the road right here. He's saying this, God sees and knows your habits. Do you have good habits in your marriage or do you have bad habits in your marriage? Do you have good habits in your digital space or do you have bad habits in your digital space? Where do you go habitually when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? Halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired is where we make our bad habit decisions. Where do we stop and say, no, I'm not getting to the line. I'm running the other way. God's given me a door of escape and I'm taking that door. Make sure that your wagon tracks are a daily habit of pursuing intimacy with your Lord and with your spouse. And if you're single, with your Lord, with your Lord, with your Lord, until he gives you a spouse, if he chooses to do that, and then you'll be ready to walk that out. Close with this. Not one of us is free from sexual sin. Every one of us has felt the burn of lust. Everybody has felt a compliment from somebody you shouldn't have felt it as deep as you felt it. A touch that sent a little zing through your body. Every one of us has sinned in this area. That doesn't mean every one of us has committed adultery or is addicted to pornography or, you know, is premarital sex. I'm, I, I'm not trying to paint a blanket statement. I'm just saying every one of us knows this. We've seen the hook dangle in the water. And there's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And there's power in Jesus Christ to overcome sin. He can do that. You can be set free in Jesus I want to close with this illustration. It's such a big part of our, our culture, and most of us didn't know much about it for a long time, but um, with the play of Hamilton coming out and then being on Disney+, Plus, and then us all being locked in our homes for weeks, it got to be where we all got real familiar with this, this play, if you got Disney+. Plus. And it was based upon this book by Ron Chernow um, called Alexander Hamilton. And there's a powerful moment in the play and I'm going to read it to you in the book as well, because I don't want to just quote a Broadway play. I want to give you some history as well. Is in the play, Alexander Hamilton has an affair with a lady named Maria Reynolds. And then his wife, who's amazing, amazing lady, godly lady. If you read in the book, you'd find she's a godly, godly lady. 
that she finds out about the affair. Her name's Eliza. Not only that, they have a, a child that dies. And so there's a lot of forgiveness that needs to happen with Alexander Hamilton and his wife, Eliza. And it gets to this one point in the song, in the play, and it's very powerful. It's a song called It's Quiet Uptown. I'm talking about they moved out of the hustle and bustle and they moved to the quietness of uptown in New York City. And so this moment happens where Eliza's standing there next to Alexander Hamilton and you could just see shattered look on her face. And you could see just a repentant heart on his face. And this is how the song goes. It says, there's moments that the words don't reach. There's a grace too powerful to name. We push away what we can never understand. Sometimes we push away God. We push away the unimaginable. Here it is. They're standing in the garden. Alexander by Eliza's side. She takes his hand. It's quiet uptown. Forgiveness, can you imagine? Forgiveness, can you imagine? And what happens in the play? She's standing there and you can see the brokenness on her and you can see the repentance in him. And she just simply takes his hand and his head drops and he begins to sob. And they begin at that point to try to work things out. The forgiveness of Jesus, he's held out his hands for you and for me. Now to repair your marriage, if this is your story, it's gonna take a long time possibly, and it may never happen. But you walk in true repentance and you walk in trusting the Lord. This is how it puts it in the book on page 554. One suspects that Alexander and Eliza had slowly repaired the harm done by the Reynolds affair and that she had begun to forgive him and that they had recaptured some early intimacy. Perhaps it took this scandal for Hamilton to realize and recognize just how vital his wife had been in providing solace from his controversial political career. Don't take each other for granted and invest in the intimacy of your relationship. The pain is deep on the other side if you don't. And there's forgiveness of Jesus. So it's not a warning on a wheelbarrow, not a warning on a burrito truck, not a warning on a drill, not a warning on an iron. It's a warning for our souls to take heed of. Father, we come in Jesus' name and we thank you that your word in this sex-crazed culture speaks to these things. To the lust and the spark we feel in our hearts at times. May we see that that spark turns to a forest fire if we're not careful. So we come in Jesus' name and we ask, Father, for our single adults and our students that you would keep purity just in their hearts and their lives, God. Make them make right decisions in a culture that tells them, hey, if it feels good, do it. Whatever desires you have, God gave them to you. And Lord, instead, may they walk with the truth of your word, with the lamp and the light of your word. Help them with these untimely desires before marriage to have the self-control of the fruit of the Spirit. Father, for those of us that are married, we give you thanks for so many, 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 many people in our church that have been married for decades that serve as role models to us. Thank you, Lord. Protect our marriages. Let us be careful. Let us be wise so that we don't get to step nine, justifying one through eight. We need your help and strength. May we be thought rude instead of interested. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for our wives. We thank you for our husbands, protected. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. To find out more about Houston's First, you can subscribe to our channel or you can go to houstonsfirst.org.